All Saints Day. Now, the history of All Saints is um, is something like when I try and back a trailer into a garage. It's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit of a mess. But um, this might not happen to you. So when I back it in, I tend not to get it very straight. And it kind of veers off in one direction, and then I overcompensate, and it goes in. But as long as you stay inside, as long as you don't run into the walls... I figure you've had a successful crack at this. It's my definition of success in backing a trailer. Nobody got hurt. Um, All Saints Day started historically as a, a remembering of all the saints. All those that had died in the faith and love of God. And then it's, it became a time when we remembered particularly those who were famous, whose names were recorded, uh, some who maybe had had miracles attributed to them. I'm getting to that. And so it sort of swings a bit like a pendulum backwards and forwards. Technically, at the moment, All Saints Day we remember the saints, and All Souls Day we remember all those that have died in the presence of God. But it's important to remember both, and we remember them honouring their memory and wondering what we might learn from them. So, the saints. Now, you've got to love the 12th and 13th century. It must have been an incredibly creative time. Because they, they had some stories of miracles attributed to saints. And part of me suspects that they might not have been 100% historically accurate at that moment. You see, there were stories that were told to demonstrate some particular nature or character of the saint in question. So I used to teach at St. Hilda's. And the story of St. Hilda is that in in the establishment of her abbey at Whitby, she was so holy, she so demonstrated in her life the presence of God that all the snakes nearby uh, were literally petrified, and they curled up and turned into stone, which is why Hilda's uh, symbol is the Ammonite. If any of you know your uh, sort of your pre-Cambrian history, uh, the Ammonites obviously were not serpents that turned into stone in, in Hilda's time. But the story was told so that people could understand how much in her teaching and in her living she demonstrated the holiness of God. And that's a pretty impressive story. But um, St. Dennis, I think, does better. St. Dennis was an evangelist. And and he was evangelizing very successfully. So much so that the king of the city where he was, uh, who was not a Christian, didn't want him around. So he ordered him executed. uh, And he ordered him beheaded. Now, for most of us, being beheaded would probably put a crimp in our um, evangelical preaching. But not St. Dennis. The legend goes, he picks up his head and walks through town, continuing to preach about the love of God. The story might have been embellished a little, is my suspicion. But doesn't it say something, that people went, this person is so passionate for sharing the story of the love of God, evangelism, that even death isn't going to put a crimp in that, isn't going to slow him down. One of the St. Margaret's, St. Margaret of Antioch, um, her father didn't like the fact that she uh, was very prayerful and had converted to Christianity. So he had her arrested and thrown in the dungeon. And she took with her a cross. And she was praying. And during the night, a dragon turned up. Once again, maybe not historically accurate. And ate her. 
But that didn't stop her from praying. <laughs> Probably would have thrown me off my game if I'm going to be honest. However, she kept praying. And the cross that she was holding on to so frustrated the innards of the dragon that it burst open and released her in, back into her prison where she continued praying. Like I say, you've got to love the 12th and 13th century. And I'm not entirely sure these are historically accurate recallings of the events. In fact, I suspect they're not. But what they are is they are stories that people told and shared to point to some particular character of these saints. So, St. Margaret, St. Hilda, profoundly holy in life and teaching, so much so that evil couldn't stand to be around her. St. Dennis, so passionate in his evangelism that not even death would put a crimp in his style. And uh, St. Margaret of Antioch, so prayerful that even being eaten by a dragon wasn't enough to interrupt her prayers. So those are, if you will, the, the examples of the saints. And the stories were told to encourage people in their godly living, in their evangelism, in their prayer life. And many of us as Christians could use a bit of a G-up in those areas, I suspect. A bit of encouragement to be more sincere in our prayers, more forthright in our evangelism, more godly in our living. And if you want some more, if you will, practical day-to-day -day examples of how that might look, because we tend not to have to, and I'm very grateful for this, we tend not to have to deal with dragons and beheadings in our current environment. And I'm very grateful for that, don't get me wrong. I want to turn to Jesus' teachings. And the first set in today's Gospels, because we read the Beatitudes, are a series of blessings and woes. And we tend not to use the word woe very much these days. I don't know, I haven't used it in casual conversation myself recently. But for me, the first clue is the way Jesus does it. And he starts by saying, those who are poor are blessed. Those who hunger are blessed. Those who are weeping are blessed. Those who are hated and reviled and rejected because of the Son of Man, because of Jesus, are blessed. And that would have been quite the shock for people back then. Because in their minds, if you were poor, or if you were hungry, or rejected by society, it was a sign that God had already done that to you. That is, if you were poor, it was because God had turned God's back on you and did not love you. And so it was appropriate then for society not to love you. God doesn't love you, why should we? Jesus is saying, that might be a fair question, but God loves those people dearly and profoundly, so much so that they are amongst the blessed. And then, he's, then uh, he, he has a go at those who are wealthy, uh, those who are, who are full. I suspect not necessarily just those that have just eaten a meal, but those who allow we wealth and food to control their lives. Those who allow people's public perception of them to dominate all their choices and decisions. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who ill treat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Now there are a couple of ideas and explanations around this. But in Jesus' day, in, in, in this time in history, to be slapped was to be publicly shamed. It was a sign that you are not worth much more of my attention than a quick flick of the wrist, and you are dismissed. And some people theorize that Jesus might be saying, well, this is, you know, turn the other cheek as well. 
uh, show the hypocrisy of the person's actions. I suspect that whilst that might work, it wouldn't have worked back then because you would have just got slapped again. And people didn't see it that way. We only see it that way because we've been shaped by the teachings of Jesus. I think this is Jesus being deeply countercultural. He's being he's preaching directly against our need to be seen as big and important, to be puffed up and aggrandized. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. Give more than people have every right or possibility to expect. Don't make the, your life transactional, says Jesus. Be generous, kind, and loving. And you won't always fit into society if you do those things. But you will be amongst those who God describes as the blessed. And you'll be in the tradition of the saints, those for whom people in the 12th and 13th century made up stories, and more importantly, all those that have lived and worked knowing the presence and love of God. So on All Saints Day, we remember all the saints, and we recommit ourselves to leading holy, enthusiastic, prayerful lives. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.